ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on November 18th, 2024. I'm Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Um, joining with me tonight, I'll start to my right, of board members. John Hurd. Eric Helmuth. Uh, Diane Mahan. Leonard oh, Diggins. James Feeney. Michael Cunningham. Ashley Moore. Thank you. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format, consistent with provisions in state law for remote participation in public meetings. Before we begin, please note the following. This meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcasted on ACMI. People wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. People participating either in person or by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name and place of residence in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and minutes page. If technical difficulties sever the remote connection to one or more participants and efforts to reconnect within a reasonable period of time fail, the in-person meeting will continue at the discretion of the chair provided that a quorum of the board is physically present. Zoom participants are encouraged to retain the phone number provided in their confirmation email for a backup audio connection to the meeting. Tonight there will be an opportunity for public participation during our open forum period. If you're attending by Zoom and want to participate, please raise your hand when I announce that public comment is open. While we have only 10 items on the agenda this evening, there is a lot of work to be done and let's see how much of it we can get done this evening. Um, so we have items two and three on the agenda end of year budget report and our property tax classification hearing. With the board's indulgence, I'm gonna, um, before actually I get into the agenda item, um, I do wanna report that over the weekend, uh, former town manager Don Marquis passed away. Uh, he served as Arlington's town manager from November 1966 to November 2000, a period of 34 years and uh, left a lasting imprint on the community. So before we begin with the agenda, I would ask uh, for a moment of silence uh, for, for Don Marquis. Thank you. Uh, and, and before we, we move on to the agenda items, I do want to offer any comments any board members would like to make. And I'll start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for um, having that moment of silence. Uh, brand new baby selectman, uh, the town manager was Don Maki, who had uh, quite a reputation uh, in terms of longevity and really creating the position um, as town manager. And for as much as we agreed and sometimes disagreed, um, I can honestly say I so benefited coming in as a, a brand new member of the board under a Don Maquis because I really feel that shaped my knowledge in terms of the town um, in, in working with Don Maquis. People who knew me when I first came on the board, I was, sometimes it was a four to one board, I was the one, and I respected that. You know, I picked the game I wanted to play in and I knew my position, but I can tell you with Mr. Maquis, um, he was always very informative, always answered all my questions, which was a little difficult in the beginning for some other um, people. Um, but he always maintained that professionalism. Um, sometimes uh, he would say, you know, I'm probably giving you more information than you need, which is no such thing with me. Um, and I really grew, um, I respected him as the town manager from day one, but in, in my few years of, of working with him, certainly grew to appreciate him. And then as we um, move forward um, with different town managers, um, each time I grew more and more to realize um, what a great benefit he was to the town, how much he really loves Arlington, him and his wife, Elena, and their family. And in his retirement days, it was nice to bump into him. And he was in 
union guy and a retiree and for the working person. And um, so he, he covered the gamut. So he, he's going to be dearly missed, especially by his family. So thank you, Mr. Thank, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, if any other members? Uh, uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to express my condolences to his family. I only know, knew Mr. Marquis when I was quite young, so I, I didn't have a working relationship with him. But, you know, so as I serve in this role, I certainly get a lot of war stories from my father when he was on the board of, then Board of Selectmen. And he always had a great experience with Don from the stories I hear. He was certainly a strong town manager under the t strong town manager provisions. Um, but I think he also paid the way he operated in the position. He paved the way for some of the town managers that we've had. And we've had a good run of town managers in this town since he retired. And I think we might not have had that if it wasn't for his leadership all those years. So great guy. Great town manager, and certainly a, a big loss for the town. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to offer a few. Uh, Mr. Diggins? I didn't know the, I didn't know him, you know, but I, certainly my condolences to him and his family. And from what I hear, you know, and, uh, he was a really good guy. So I mean, we're fortunate to have had him. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, and I just want to offer a few comments. I, um, when I was first on the finance committee, Don was still the town manager, and it was always a special night when he <laughs> came to FinCom. And, and uh, um, it, uh, you know, there was, there was some, some challenges, but you always felt like the town was in good hands. And I just want to share something back from my high school days, and, and something I'll never forget um, that he did for me as a, a high school student. I, when I was a junior in high school, the town had the town government day. And there was four of us, three of us from Arlington High and one from Arlington Catholic who were town manager for the day. And that just happened to be a day that Don was going into the State House for a, a signing by Governor King. Um, it was Water Conservation Week and, and Arlington had come up with the idea for it. And so he spoke to all of the students down in the auditorium, met the four of us and said, we're going to go into the State House. And, and it, it was tight. I don't think he realized there was four town manager designees that day from two grades and two schools. But we all piled into the Crown Victoria, went into the State House, and, and the four students uh, got a picture with Governor King as he signed the proclamation. And, and Don made sure that it was about the students that day. And, and you know, he didn't come in. He wanted us to, to, to really have that great experience. And going into the city and, and coming out, he talked about his job, asked us questions, and, and uh, it was just really a, a, a day I, I'll, I never, never will forget, um, just a special day because he took the time to take us. He could have assigned town government day to somebody else and gone in on his own, but it was he cared about the next generation. He cared about the town, and um, I would see him after that and remind him from time to time how much I appreciate it. So my condolences to the Marquis family and, and, um, and you know, Don, his, um, all the work he did and when we're on the bike path, we, it's Donald Marquis Bikeway named after him. So um, it, it just, uh, his lasting impact on Arlington will be for a long time. So uh, with that, I will move on to um, item number four. We'll take that out of, out of order. Um, and this is a proclamation for Dr. George F. Grant. I want to thank Dave Ledwig um, from in town here, who actually put this up, had, had shared this. And, and um, as I'm reading it, we can, I don't know if that's blocking you, Mrs. No, Mahan. That's fine. But I'll read the proclamation first, and then we can ask um, for motions from the board. Whereas Dr. George F. Grant developed the first golf tee on his property in Arlington Heights, and 125 years ago, on December 12, 1899, received U.S. Patent Number 638920 for his invention, whereas in 1991, nearly a century after his patent, the United States Golf Association finally gave Dr. Grant recognition that he was the inventor of the first golf tee. Whereas the son of freed slaves, George moved to Boston, becoming a dental assistant, a graduate of the founding class at Harvard Dental School in 1870, the first African-American faculty member at Harvard, a prominent Boston area dentist, and a recognized expert in treating patients, 
and instructing students with cleft palate treat treatments, whereas the remarkable story of Dr. Grant's life is not widely known to Arlington residents or elsewhere, although some have been inspired when they do hear his story, including the founder of the annual original Tee Golf Classic Tournament, now in its 25th year, that honors Dr. Grant and early African-American contributors to the game of golf, whereas Dr. Grant's story will be more widely told, and especially on December 12th each year, that Dr. Grant's story can be inspirational to all who hear it. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of the select board, do hereby honor and recognize on the 125th anniversary of Dr. Grant's patent day for the invention in Arlington of the first golf tee and for his amazing life story as the first African-American faculty member at Harvard and as a pioneering dentist in Boston and proclaimed December 12th, 2024, Dr. George F. Grant Day in the town of Arlington. Um, Mr. Hurd? Move approval. And um, certainly thank Mr. Ludwig for bringing this forward. It's a worthy cause that I didn't know about and I've lived in the town for a long time. And I'd like to thank Dr. Grant for the, inventing the tea. I wish he would just invent a tea that makes the ball go straight every time. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. Um, so I'm happy to move approval on this. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll second and, and I'll also uh, express my appreciation you know, for Mr. Woodwick and for working um, on this. And, and, and I, I, I appreciate the golf tee, but I really appreciate the dental work, you know, it's dentistry, especially since I've been getting a lot of dental work lately, and I can only imagine you know, what the challenge it was you know, back then. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Ledwig for um, bringing this to our attention and, and highlighting such a great Arlingtonian that um, I, too, was not aware of uh, the great history, not only for the golf tee. I don't play golf because I'm not good at it, and I'm a sore loser, so <laughs> <laughs> you won't. But um, in terms of his appointment at, at Harvard and his dentistry expertise and cleft palate, um, th there's quite a bit of information there. And whatever we can do going forward um, for on December 12th, and uh, I would just ask Dave that... Um, Either the select board could also send a copy of this proclamation and the attachments over to our colleagues on the school committee and um, Dr. Holm and the superintendent, unless you're already planning on making a presentation. Um, and I only say that because I think that's really good information also for the school side to have, um, which I'm sure some of the administrators and teachers over there are probably aware of this history. Um, but I think a few might not be, and that might spur something in terms of the curriculum and um, if the Arlington Alumni Association, which I'm not in either, but <laughs> who knows moving forward. Um, it, it, uh, Dr. Grant certainly seems like a, a worthy recipient. So, um, so if you could just, Mr. Ludwig, Dave, um, let the office know. If you already have plans on the school side, I don't want to usurp that or, or you know, um, or if, we, if you, you have plans and you'd like us to still do that, as an adjunct to it, happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, and uh, one other thing, I th th thank you to Mr. Ludwig for bringing this forward to us. This is a, a this was prepared by Mr. Ludwig. This is, if uh, hopefully it shows on ACMI, but this is the actual T that was the invention by Dr. Grant. And um, I also done a little bit of research because I didn't know much about Dr. Grant's history. It's fascinating, just uh, what he had done as a dentist, but. I learned a little bit more about his time here in Arlington and he owned property on Hillside Ave and he had a meadow course next to his house on Hillside Ave which is roughly where 118 Hillside Ave is between Florence and Oakland Ave. That's where he would practice, his daughter would caddy for him and uh, at, at the time he invented the tea. And at that time uh, his house was the fifth house on the left from Wallston. It's, it's much more than that now at 118, but um, it's just a remarkable story, and I really appreciate um, the, Mr. Ludwig bringing it to our attention, and uh, it's certainly worthy of recognition on, on December 12th. So um, we have a motion by Mr. Hurd uh, for approval seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> a lot of great Arlingtonians on that road. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Talking about Ed Burns. 
Okay, um, item five is. Did you want? Did we do two or three? Two or three. We're going to go back to. I want oh. to do the proclamations oh, okay. first, and then oh, and then come back to the presentation. Um, so, so, item five is a proclamation that we do. Um, we have done for the past several years for Small Business Saturday. Since we don't have much on the agenda, I'm going to read this one as well. Um, whereas. The government of Arlington, Massachusetts celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community. And whereas, according to the U.S. Small Business Administration, 68 cents of every dollar spent at a small business in the United States stays in the local community. And every dollar spent at small businesses creates an additional 48 cents in local business activity as a result of employees and local businesses purchasing local goods and services. And whereas there are 33 million small businesses in the United States and in Arlington, we are home to nearly 1,700 business establishments. The overwhelming majority, 89.7%, are operated by less than 10 employees. And whereas small businesses are responsible for nearly two-thirds of net new jobs, and in 2024 alone, Arlington welcomed 87 new businesses. And in fiscal year 2024, the town's hospitality industry generated 1.3 million in local meals and rooms receipts. And whereas Arlington, Massachusetts supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our communities. And whereas advocacy groups, as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Select Board of Arlington, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim November 30th, 2024, as Small Business Saturday and urge the residents of our community and communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and to shop small throughout the year. Turn to the board. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I happily move approval. I think this is something that we routinely do, but it's a really good reminder that uh, to the health of a community, a small business, so much more of your dollars that you spend in a small, small business stay in the community um, on average than to a, to a national retailer, and certainly more if you're ordering online. Um, and I, I deeply appreciate the small businesses we have in town, and I want them to stay. I want to be able to go down and get my home supplies at, at Shaddix and, and party supplies at, at Playtime and, and everything else and all the many businesses that we have. And I know that I, when we do that, we're contributing to our neighbors, to our local economy, and to the, to the ability to have these services right where we want. And that has an important, uh, plays an important part in making Arlington a livable community. So uh, I appreciate you bringing this forward and I happily move approval. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Hurd. A second. <clears throat> and just, again, echo what was in the proclamation. I want to thank, you know, we're lucky in Arlington to have an amazing Chamber of Commerce with Beth Locke and her entire crew that she has working with her. And a lot of amazing members on ATED who I serve on that committee we really all meet month after month to try to think of ways to revitalize some of our business districts, invest in small businesses, and promote people shopping within the town. And over the past few years, we've come up with a lot of kind of neat ways to do that. And uh, participate in Small Business Saturday is certainly a way to do that. And, uh, and I think we can add that we already approved no parking fees on Small Business Saturday, so you can come and you don't have to pay the meters. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, okay. On a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. It is approved. Now, returning to item two, our end of year budget report, Ida Cody, our comptroller, and uh, She'll be making the presentation. We also have a memo from her and Alex McGee, our Deputy Town Manager and Finance Director, who's here this evening. Good evening, Ms. Cody. Good evening. Ira Cody, Time Controller. I'm here to present the end of the year budget report for the fiscal year 24. Um, for the period ended 6-30-2024. You've received this big report, so I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but I will give you the essence. We certified free cash, 20597993 this year. 
Um, there's a long formula to calculate the free cash, but I'm just going to give you the, the abbreviated version, which is um, we had a turn back in appropriations of a net of $2.7 million, of which $17,000 was from the school department. Uh, we had revenue surplus of $7.6 million, and of course they added half of last year's free cash to the formula to arrive at $20.6 million. Um, I'm just going to give you some uh, brief budget highlights. Um, on the expense side, the expenses cover operating expenses and the articles. Usually the articles roll over two fiscal years and the operating expenses cover the salaries and the ordinary maintenance. Most uh, departments spend their budgets within the original appropriations, but we did need two reserve transfers from the reserve fund. One was in the amount of $400,000 for the school department, and the other one was $380,000 on the town side. We needed, um, four departments needed additional um, appropriation. The legal department for a legal settlement, the election because we had a special election, fire for some employee buyouts, and the facilities department, this was due to the um, electricity cost increase of roughly 40%. Um, on the articles, you will see that we had a turn back of approximately $935,000, which actually don't really turn back. They, need, they are being carried forward into fiscal year 25. Included in this $900,000 is the salary reserve of $688,000. On the revenue side, um, almost all categories exceeded the projection, but I'm just going to touch on the main drivers. Um, the motor vehicle excise, uh, we've collected 122%. Uh, this was, uh, we exceeded the, the original projection by $1 million for a total of $5.8 million. Excise tax includes meals and uh, hotel excise. Both exceeded uh, the projections, but marijuana, uh, we, um, we missed the projection and we are only at 78% down from fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, ambulance fees, we had a surplus of $575,000. This is mostly because we increased the rates a few years ago and we also do more in-house um, service, uh, uh, service calls. And um, ISD, again, we uh, performed really well at 224%. This is mostly building wire gas permits. Uh, we had two large projects at 1025 Mass Avenue, 50 units, and 80 Broadway, we had a five-story building. And lastly, the interest. Um, the um, interest rates were very favorable. We had a very, very conservative projection of $200,000. Total um, interest uh, received was $3.5 million, but this is mostly because we borrowed money for the high school and for the DPW, and we had large amounts of money in the banks, which is not gonna be the case this year, but we did double the uh, projection for fiscal year 25. And finally, the enterprise funds, uh, all uh, five enterprise funds had healthy retained earnings and they're listed in the report. Um, all, all funds collected almost 100% of the revenue except the water and sewer because we had um, a dry summer, we only hit 91%. And uh, they've spent almost 100% of their appropriations. I've also listed other major funds uh, per your request, the cash balance at 630. And that's all I have for a summary for you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Th th thank you very much, Ms. Cody. And I'll turn to the board. Questions, comments? Um, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to move receipt of the uh, year in budget report from our comptroller and our finance director, deputy town manager. Um, I also would like to thank Ms. Cody and Mr. McGee. Um, since you're here, we also recently had a long range planning uh, meeting, which Mr. DeCourcy also chairs that meeting. <clears throat> and I'm digressing a little, so I'll do it briefly, but I wanna thank 
Mr. McGee, Alex, for working with the town manager and running such an efficient meeting with 16 to 20 different people on the, both the town and school side and really anticipating everything. There were very few questions and um, inquiries like that. And I also want to thank Ms. Cody because the questions that did come up, which nobody could know about, both you and Mr. McGee, um, had already anticipated it as well as you know this like the back of your hand because um, that's your expertise, so I do appreciate that. Um, one of the other things I'll note, besides climate change is real, this is once again another year that we don't see anything under uh, uh, DPW for we had to increase a reserve fund transfer for the snow and ice um, expenses because they're pretty much we're non-existent again. Um, the other thing that I, I do want to say thank you to and, and, and thank you to the town manager, Mr. Feeney and Mr. McGee, um, for continuing with what uh, Ms. Cody uh, referenced at the end of the presentation regarding listing cash balances uh, at the end of the most recent fiscal year uh, to the board, um, which really is timely in terms of us going forward this year and next year um, uh, in terms of what the operating budget looks like and, and what projections that we have, as well as I know this board uh, will have some decisions to make, as well as some opinions to express to the town manager. And there's a couple of budget busters um, coming up before us, uh, namely uh, trash, recycling, solid waste, as well as, and I see that we've put money aside for anticipated collective bargaining agreements, which are being negotiated right now, but um, I won't go into a long diatribe on that, but um, those are two al along with other things. So this kind of reporting, this report, when I first got on the board, it took many, many years to actually get it generated uh, with your predecessors, and then to get it in a, a readable, usable f format that you could really interchange and, and um, get the information readily versus um, having to spend a lot of time at a meeting or set up a separate meeting. And um, my lack of questions on what's in here is only because um, we've been getting this type of report for several years now. Um, and we, as well as we can, know it like the back of our hand. Um, and, and it does shape our decisions. So um, I do want to thank everybody for that. And um, moving forward next year and the year after, I'm sure that we'll have a lot more detailed discussions as we talk about some serious budget drivers that, that will need to be considered and, and uh, planned for. So, thank you. Th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cody, as usual, for um, an excellent report and a good summary of it. Uh, I just want to get some clarity for myself and reinforce my understanding of some of the, uh, the, uh, the source of the turnbacks. I'm just looking through the report. It, it, uh, is it Pretty much across the board, the, the biggest driver of these turnbacks are just unfilled st uh, staff positions in salary turnbacks? Uh, that was the case last year. This year, it's, most, it's a combination, but mostly on the ordinary maintenance side. And, and expenses, regular expenses, not necessarily salary. Mm. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's, so it's a combination. It's things. a combination, yeah. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, oh, go ahead. You can see it in the report. It's actually detailed and broken out by salaries and expenses right. each. I could do a summary for you, but you can also uh, uh, zoom into, let's say, a department that, of interest, and you see which category turn back, salary or um, sure. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, or I see ordinary you. expenses. But it's this year, it's just a, it's a combination of It's a combination of both. that, sure. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, and Mr. Chair, if I could, through sure. you, maybe ask the town manager. Um, or, or perhaps Mr. McGee, whatever he feels is appropriate. But um, is, is what we're seeing with, with the salaries, um, is that kind of typical for what we've seen the past years? Is that unusual this year, in, just in what you know in terms of hiring across the town, at least on the town side, and, and retention and all that? Mr. Feeney? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. What I would say is with respect to salaries or vacant positions, that has been fairly steady post-pandemic, mm -hmm. and I would say if I were to summarize it, we are hit hardest in sort of uh, laborer or truck driver type positions. So the, the departments feeling it the most are going to be uh, facilities and public works right now with respect to the number of vacancies that we have, which I think at last check was perhaps at 70 plus. So we're, yeah. we're yeah, still feeling it. 
Yeah, I think I, know, I have mixed feelings about those turn, turnbacks that are, that are generated by salaries and that on the one hand, we, we appreciate showing that, that the taxpayers that we don't spend money that we don't need to spend um, and that we use that we're careful stewards of the money. On the other hand, those are services that we need too. And I know that one of the hardest parts of, of the town manager's job and the finance team is in, in the management team is trying to find that, that balance. And um, so I appreciate that. And I think, I guess another question for, uh, for the town manager would be, you know, based on what you're seeing with the turn backs and, you know, thinking as we look to our long-term planning and, and the deficits in the years out that we're trying to shave, is there anything in this report that has caused you to, to rethink scaling back any of the budgeting or, or are you thinking in the budget you'll submit that we're still leave that headroom in hopes that, you know, we'll be able to do more with, with, the, uh, with the hiring? I think at this point, uh, Mr. Helmuth, we would continue with the headroom we have, but need to be guided by the results of our most recent salary survey mm -hmm. and allow that to dictate any sort of changes or ne next steps that we may wish to make with number of positions or with compensation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and my, my final question, I think Ms. Cody may have covered this briefly in her remarks, but um, just due to the nature of this, we're reporting on the town side operating uh, budget, but the schools are actually our, lar our largest top level item and um, and so that's not naturally factored into this report. But did you have a figure for what the school's department did have as a turn back? Yes. So the total turn back for the school, for the, uh, the entire town, for both school and town is 2 million, 2.7, 2 million, 720,101. Mm -hmm. Of this amount, 17,000 comes from the school department. So the school department had, $90 million, and we have a net turn back of 17461 Now, included in this $2.7 million is also the reserve fund, which turns back $1.1. So if you think about it, this is not really unspent money, the whole amount, 2.7. Mm -hmm. 1.1 mm -hmm. is because we didn't need to use the whole reserve fund. So that brings it down a little. That's in useful terms context, yeah. Turn backs, yep. Thank you very much. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, anybody else? I did. Still looking for a second, too. On oh, that. Well, I'll, Mr. Diggins. I'll second it, and, and okay. I do have some questions. Oops. Sure. <laughs> no, but, um, but through to, uh, to the town manager, did you say that we were short 70 positions? I think it, it, last time I checked, there were some perhaps 70 vacancies oh. across the entire organization. Wow. Wow, I didn't realize it was that large, you know, so thank you. Uh, so, so these are just me kind of basic uh, questions to me, me, just to help me understand things. But, um, but uh, with respect to um, marijuana um, revenue versus the fees, it seems like the fees were higher uh, than expected and the revenue was lower than expected. Is that correct? The revenue was less than we expected. Right. In 22 and 23, we exceeded the projections so we increased the projection a little bit just by $4,000. But this year we missed the projection. Yeah. So uh, We were expecting we'd be getting more. Yeah. Uh, I mean, right after COVID and during COVID, was, we did better. Yeah. Okay, because I know that also, I mean, there was some change I mean, in the regulation or policy, whatever, regarding how we are we calculating or, or anticipating. I mean, that's different. Okay. That's a fee that they have to pay uh, to the town that we are not allowed to um, estimate it. So right. we have two companies that and they are paying the um, community host agreement. Right. Those, uh, yes, they did change the method of calculation, but for those we didn't have an estimate. We only estimate the excise, the portion that from the sales that comes back to the town. Right, and that- And we, we, we've missed that projection. Yeah, that we didn't was, sell as much as we thought we would. Right, and that was what was 174%, the, the excise fees? It was combined, was 145. The excise is combined with meals right. and hotel. Meals, hotels, and marijuana. Okay. The marijuana came at 78%, right. whereas meals and uh, hotel came at over 160 and, um, um, meals at 162 and hotel at 177. All right, got you. I, you know, I was just looking at the narrative. Thank you. You know, so on the state revenue, you know, that is that the the cherry sheet. Cherry sheet. Okay, fine. You know, that's what I thought. The property taxes. I mean, there's an interesting adjustment there. You know, can you explain I mean, what's going on um, in that 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 row? 
because it was the, it was 153 million apparently, yeah. and then there was an adjustment. It seems like of 236,000. Then. I mean, I'm just not quite sure why and then what happened. The adjustment is because we originally estimated it all in real estate, but actually we have to break it out in real estate and personal property. So I just moved it okay. right. between real estate. But they are all grouped under the, the property. All right. All right. I mean, um, so please, like just thank curiosity you. stuff. I mean, that's odd and I didn't quite understand it. So thank you. That's it. Yep. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, further. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Ms. Cody. I, I, you know, we enjoy the quarterly reports. I, the, the end of year report is really the one um, that, that <laughs> carries the most meaning in terms of where we're standing and what's coming back. And, and we appreciate the, the, the work that you and Mr. McGee have done. Appreciate the work that Mr. Feeney has done managing the, uh, the, 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 the town budgets as well. So um, on a motion for receipt by Mrs. Mahan that was seconded by Mr. Diggins, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. Now we're ready for our 715 hearing. <laughs> our property tax classification. Uh, discussion and vote on property tax classification and tax rate. Dana Mann, Director of Assessments, and William Zagata, the Chair of the Board of Assessors. Um, welcome them up. And uh, while they're coming up, I also welcome the other two members of the Board of Assessors, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor and Gordon Jamison, who are here this evening. So. Uh, Thank you for being here and look forward to the presentation. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just take a quick minute to introduce myself. I'm William Zagata. I'm the current chair of the Board of Assessors. Um, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor and Gordon Jameson, and also Dana Mann, who is the Director of Assessments. Um, I think tonight we'll have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Well, we certainly have a lot of numbers to talk about. Yes. So uh, I guess without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to Dana. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, everyone has a copy of the packet. A um, couple of things before we get started. I'd like to recognize um, the work uh, my staff did this year in uh, not only developing this report, um, but we also uh, participated in a DOR certification year, uh, once every five years. And uh, the work that they did in that uh, effort, um, I'd truly like to recognize uh, Mary McMakin, Jenny O'Rourke, and Mitch Suarez. Um, also, the report tonight, you'll, you'll recognize all of the pages in the report. <coughs> but we've moved them around a little bit. Um, we've moved all of the uh, tax rate data up front and the classification material uh, is now in the back of the report. But uh, I, I will go through this and please stop me at any point. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, We can start on page one. So these are the items that go into establishing the tax rate for the year. I think you're all familiar with this report. Uh, but just to move through these items, uh, to calculate the tax rate, we start with the previous year tax levy limit. Um, this year we, had a, we have an added feature. Uh, we have a uh, an amendment for growth. And what that means is that one of our abatements was to a, an entity that had reported, where we had reported growth in 24. So uh, the Department of Revenue requires that we give that back. Um, moving on, we have added to that the Proposition 2.5, uh, which resulted in three million five hundred thousand two hundred nine dollars this year uh, growth this year I'm happy to report uh, one million four hundred and thirty five thousand six hundred and sixty nine dollars um, we also add to that this year the 2025 override that was seven million dollars and that gives us the FY 25 levy limit 
of $151,944,245. Uh, to further calculate that, we add the FY25 school debt exclusion. So this is after Proposition 2 and a, two and a half. And that brings our um, what's called maximum total to be raised to $166,280,398. Uh, to calculate the tax rate, we take the amount, uh, the total taxable uh, value of the town, and we divide that into the amount to be raised. Uh, which gives us a tax rate of $10.77. From that, we calculate what's called the excess levy capacity, and that is $74,780 this year. Uh, and also new this year, we have the uh, senior means-tested exemption. And if anyone is unfamiliar with that, we have information on our website. Um, but the, the effect of that exemption was to reduce the total residential value by the amount exempted. Um, the, and you can see that we show that here, the amount exempted. I didn't calculate it for you, uh, but I can give you the number is $2,035,236. Um, so that's reduced from the total residential value, and it gives us our total taxable value. So you can see that that's going to be different uh, when we get further into some of these reports. You'll see a different total valuation. So I wanted to show that information there. Any questions on that page? Or? <clears throat> I think so. Moving on. Uh, so we talked about the, the total growth number for the town, and on page two, we break that down into where the growth came from, uh, what property class uh, the growth was in, and also the number and value of abatements uh, by property class. Um, and I do, did want to mention that um, the growth number is created by using the previous year tax value. Um, and we've been seeing growth in our value, which is lowering our tax rate. Um, so our, our, unfortunately, that impacts on our growth amount. Uh, but we were still able to show a um, higher than usual growth amount. Moving on to page three, we have the classification report. So here what we're doing is breaking down our values um, by property type into the various um, class codes established by the Department of Revenue. And I do want to point out the exempt value. Um, is over $1 billion this year. And that's largely due to assessing the Arlington High School building and lot. That was one of my questions, so you already answered it. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Sure, no. And, and, and Mr. Mann, before you, you, you go on, that exempt value and parcel count, that would be that includes government property as well as charitable and religious property as well. Yes, it does. Moving on to page four. Um, what we show here is, is what changed from year to year. So we have our 24 figures compared to the new 25 figures. Um, and we can see that um, single family uh, homes grew at a rate of 6.14%. The total adjustment for the town was 6.27%. That's an increase in valuation. 
Um, and we can see one, one anomaly that I want to point out here is uh, halfway down the page. Um, because this was a certification year, we see a 27% growth in 501 personal property accounts. Um, part of the five year certification is a review and an audit of personal property. So we hired a company to come in and, and what's called discover uh, all of the personal property that is not currently on the books. So we added a, a, a large number of um, personal property accounts. Um, but the average personal property account in that class actually decreased. Um, Can I? Sure. Uh, Ms. <clears throat> Um, and I apologize if I'm cutting you off um, on this page. The two questions I had, one you, you just addressed on, on 501 uh, with the 27%. The other one um, I had a question about was uh, 508, the 16%. Um, and, and, and I looked at the assessed value and, and the other figures that you have in there, but could you just give me a little bit more, expand on that just a little bit for sure. my so, naivete? So that category does fluctuate. That is our cellular uh, equipment that's actually physically in town. Okay. And uh, that, when they upgrade that equipment, you see the value change um, quite a bit. And, and that, though, that equipment will depreciate over time, but it's when they make a large upgrade uh, that we see the value increase. Okay, and um, this does not have to be done or adopted, um, but I've noticed since I've been on the board that this report, like um, the previous report, has changed and expanded and more information has been included to make it more readable. So um, I was just wondering, and I'm not, if it's, if it's really going to th throw everything off and change it into something else and it's too cumbersome, it doesn't have to be done, but um, if you said you can have whatever you want, your druthers. Um, moving forward, if they, for the 501 to 508 uh, classifi classifications, either if more cumbersome would be a legend at the bottom saying what 501 through 508 is, or if under the type, whatever limited explanation, like 508 instead of saying per prop, um, if it says per prop, cellular, or just cellular. So you don't have to do that, but trying to avoid the questions that I'm asking you here tonight, just because it's, this is not my expertise, but sure. just moving forward for the 501 to 508, either a legend or um, a little explanation in, in the type column, so I don't keep asking you questions that I should know, but I only see this once a year, and I try to retain it. So thank you, sorry for interrupting. I think we can accommodate that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, moving on to page five. And what this report is showing is the components of the tax rate and the, uh, the amounts they represent. Um, so starting in the upper right-hand corner, we have the, what's called the levy base. So as we started with the previous year levy, that's what that's accounting for. Um, the value of the proposition two and a half was 23 cents. Uh, growth represented nine cents. Uh, the override uh, represented 46 cents. And the school debt was 93 cents. And that all adds up to the 1077. And the chart below that uh, just kind of compares those numbers um, over the last five years. I know there's a lot of information there. Is there <coughs> any particular questions on that material? Just a, qu a quick question, and I think I know the answer. Am I correct under um, when we get to debt service and debt exclusions and the like? if we were looking for drivers that in the next year or two that were probably going to drastically change or zero out, that would be because of the Arlington High School project as well as the Minuteman project that we're sort of at the tail end of that so we can anticipate 
those numbers will be reflected going forward? Are we at, at the end of both of those projects pretty much? Uh, yes and no. So the Minuteman debt is not in this oh, okay. number. Um, that's a debt to the Minuteman school. What we um, provide to the Minuteman is a, an actual assessment. Um, so they're incorporating their borrowing um, into that assessment each year. I'll double check that, okay. but I believe that's accurate. Um, so your, your question was, are there uh, drivers of the um, excluded debt amount? And I would defer to the treasurer in that matter. Um, I just reflect how much we need to collect. Okay, thanks. <laughs> if I could, miss, and, 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 and it wouldn't be something that you would have to worry, you just need the amount. Um, but of the 14.3 million, the Finance Committee reports it every year in terms of what the breakdown is. In high school, of 14.3 million, mm. it's about 9.4 million of the 14.3. Um, and it, there may be the seven schools actually that are included in that because we still have some of the older elementary schools. Dallin will probably be coming off sometime soon, but that's only about 190,000 of it. But that's that breakdown. And again, it it's, wasn't expected from you, Mr. Mann, but it, it's uh, um, high school. And, and there is some debt that sneaks on, not sneaks, that's not the right word, <laughs> that is on here from Minuteman, but that just flows through through them on the on the um, on the capital side, but again, it's it's it's, it's about 1.8 million. Uh, so yeah, and Thank strike you. the word sneaks. That's that is not <laughs> what was intended there. Okay, so go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, okay, moving on to page six. Uh, we this is a chart of the historic tax rates, and you can see over the oh, certainly over the recent history that uh, increased values are driving the tax rate down. Uh, on page seven, we have a compar comparison to our peer communities. Um, so we're looking at Belmont, Winchester, and Lexington, and we've compared the um, single-family tax bill. And also this year we've included uh, not only the um, residential but also the CIP or commercial, industrial, and personal property tax rates in our comparison in the chart on the bottom of that page. And those are the numbers that are going into the tax rate. So we move now into um, the classification material. To start with, we, we establish the um, percentage share of the residential class and the uh, commercial, industrial, and personal property class. Um, and and we, we total that number for the CIP, so we combine that. So the combined uh, share of the tax levy uh, for CIP is 5.2722% this year. And the residential class is 9472 um, I will note that that number has uh, decreased, the, the total CIP has decreased in nine out of the last 10 years. Just a note. And moving on to page nine, um, should the board consider uh, shifting the tax rate, uh, there's a couple of numbers that you have to be aware of. Um, the Department of Revenue generally allows for a maximum of 150% shift. Um, so the second number um, that we want to look at is this year's minimum residential factor. Uh, now this is a factor, not a percentage. The factor is 97.2172%. 
that would be the minimum factor that could be established for the residential class. Um, and that would, that would represent a share of the total tax levy of 92.0917%. And the important number on page 10 that we want to look at, we, we, we looked at the residential factor. The number below that, the CIP share of the 25 levy, that's the current at, at, at no shift at a factor of one. Uh, the CIP maximum share would be 7.9083%. So that's our range. And on page 11, I give some examples of what that would do um, to the tax rate. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have the, um, the shear increase uh, so a 5% shift, that would be the second number down, would raise the tax rate for the CIP class to $11.31, reduce the tax rate for the residential class to $10.74. Um, but here's where we see the, the significant difference between the percentage of residential class versus commercial class. So by making that shift, the CIP tax on, on a half a million dollars uh, would increase $269. And the savings on the residential side, so the lower tax rate on the residential side would pro provide a savings of $15.69 per 500,000. And that number changes as you increase the percentage. And then the two numbers at the bottom are, <clears throat> are the share of the levy in dollars uh, as it currently stands at a factor of one. <clears throat> And then I wanted to provide some numbers around <coughs> the residential exemption. Um, the residential exemption would be based on an average assessment of the residential class. So this is not single family. This is different from, from the single family average. This is the residential average of $981,577. Um, we calculate that based on our occupancy rates in the various classes, that the number of qualified applicants would be significant at 14,895 uh, households that would qualify. Um, we can see that at a 5% adoption percentage, the tax rate on the residential class would go from $10.77 to $11.27. And then I've projected that out for the various adoption percentages down to the uh, down to 20%, although the maximum adoption is 35%. Um, so just a couple of bullet items here. The, the, we talked about the tax rate increasing. Um, the break-even point, this is where, this is the value of a home where a qualified uh, parcel would not see any increase or any uh, uh, decrease in taxes. So if you own a home below that threshold amount, you would see some uh, reduction if you were a qualifying parcel. Uh, but above that, even if you qualified, you would not see 
um, you, you would start to see increases in your taxable amount. Um, this exemption would uh, place the burden on approximately 17% of the um, homes. Uh, and as I said, most homes in Arlington are um, owner occupied and would not qualify. Well, um, would qualify. Sorry. Um, the other thing I want to mention, um, there is a small business exemption that you have an option. Um, the small business exemption, I'm sorry, there's not uh, information in your packet on this. I don't know why we have never included it. But um, to qualify for the small business exemption, you would have to have 10 or fewer employees. And it would have to be a, in a class three building. The building would have to be less than $1 million in value. Um, and it's not the business that would qualify for the discount. The discount would go to the property owner. Um, multi, so multi-tenant properties, all of the tenants, all of the businesses in that property would have to qualify to receive the discount. Um, and we estimate, we can only estimate this amount but the tax rate on the commercial class would go, would, would go from the 1077 at the single tax rate to $11.13 at 10%. Any questions? No, is, is that it for the presentation? Okay, no, thank you. Um, so before I turn to, to the board, just for clarification too, and maybe um, if we could turn to page six mm. of the, the report. And this is just the historical tax rates, but these are all the rates. And, and since tax classification started in the early 1980s, where there was an option to have a split rate between residential and commercial. But just again for the public and, and reminder for the, for the board, since 1982, We've had one rate, so we've always voted a residential factor of one. We haven't split the rate. We haven't had a residential exemption in more recent times since it's been available. We haven't had a small business exemption. So our task tonight, we don't develop the values. The assessors do that. Um, we, by voting on the residential factor, that determines what the tax rate is. So if the vote were to be a residential factor of one, it would be 1077. There are other examples that Mr. Mann um, provided here. And, and one other thing just to point out on the residential exemption, I believe there were four communities that you listed that have it. Very few have it here. Uh, Boston, Cambridge, Chelsea, and Brookline. All of those communities have split rates. So it's a further, the, the residential class is already lower than the commercial class. And then there's a further division among the class based on value. I believe that's the case in all those communities. You're, absol you're right. absolutely right. Okay. Um. Okay, so with that, uh, turn to uh, Mr. Hurd. I actually was gonna remember to add the fact of one this year. Oh. So, mm -hmm. um, thank you for the presentation. Among other very useful information, I think I've always called this the once a year reminder why we don't have two-tiered rate or a residential exemption. Um, so I will move that we set the 2025 tax rate at $10.77 at a factor of one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Second. Thank you, Mr. Helm. Uh, Mr. Diggins? I have some questions. Sure. You know, so uh, you had mentioned there was a number that you said had gone down for the last nine years or 10 years. What was that? That's the the commercial, industrial, and personal property share okay. of the um, gotcha. value right. in town. Gotcha, okay, fine, fine. You know, so um, the average being, I think it's on page, let's see, three or four. Uh, so yeah, the, 
the average assessed value, you know, of a single family home, you know, that's the mean, right? That's the mean. No, that that, that's actually an average. So we, sim we simply take the total valuation of the single family class, the 101 class, and we divide it by the number of parcels. Right, right, right. So, so that's the mean average, I mean, as opposed to the median average. You know? mm -hmm. so, so do you have a sense of the distribution yeah. you know, of, 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 of the, the, the values? I kind of get the feeling that it's maybe skewed on the low side, given the what would happen if we did an exemption, where it'd be like 17% of the households would be sharing the burden. So do you get the sense that of these single family I mean, um, homes, I mean that most of them are assessed on the low side? Or so where, where's the distribution? I don't have that information. Is that tonight. available? It's like. I, I could certainly run the numbers on yeah. that. All right. You know, all right, because I'm kind of curious about that, because it gives us a sense of like what, what the load is on on various types of, of households. Okay, you know, because uh, also along with that, it'd be interesting to see like if you were to bin them, I mean, in hundred thousand dollar units, I mean, or you know, um, yeah, values. Be, it'd be interesting to see where most of them were. You know, so are they mostly in like the 500k range or the 600k range? So I'm interested in the the, the the distribution, the medium, um, or and, and, and the mode. And okay, um, so um, <laughs> I noticed, and I really appreciate that you did this this time. You know, um, that you did give us the CIP rates. You know, um, uh, along with the the residential, because I'd asked about that last year. And it is interesting to see that there are some communities that do a split. I mean, and some of them that do the split with the residential higher, you know, than than the CIP. You know, uh, it's probably outside of, of your expertise. So I'm just going to take a long shot. Do you have a sense why? I mean, is there a policy? Yeah, I think you're that? talking about Winchester, where the residential rate is higher than yeah. the CIP. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a particular act that um, I'm, I'm not 100 percent, but my understanding of that is that they adopted an act that lets them, similar to what we used to do with our water costs, um, where they pay for a certain amount of the um, MWRA water bill up front, and it goes on the tax rate on the residential side. Um, fairly certain that's um, what it is. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, um, so, so, I mean, I'm. I'm we're clearly going to vote for this, but I just want to put something out there for future consideration. It, it, uh, it, given the ratio made of our personal, you know, in, or the property um, taxes to, to the CIP, it's like roughly seven, seventeen point five to one. Me, so for, so if we were to adjust me, me for every penny, me that we would reduce the CIP, me. Uh, um, uh, let, me, let me rephrase, yeah, I mean, for every, I'm sorry, for every penny that we would increase the personal, we, then we could reduce the CIP by 17 and a half um, cents. You know? uh, and, and what I'm getting at is that there, there an example that I'm going to give, I mean, and this isn't to uh, make Mr. Hurd upset or anything, you know, just to, it's just an example that comes to mind for me now based on some things that we've done. You know, uh, Let's say we wanted to do bike lanes, being completely down Mass Ave, being and and being and and businesses were concerned mean, about the impact of that. Mean, uh, then then I could see us potentially mean, saying like we the residents. This is something that we want. You know because we we value the 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 safety that we would get from that. We, we realized that there's the potential for it to impact businesses in the short run. Feed. And so, so I could see us maybe doing a decrease you know, in the CIP uh, uh, because we, it would take maybe I mean, five cents I mean, of, of increase I mean, in 
the personal me to me give you a really big break me on the the CIP and, and so so that'd be a way of us saying look I mean we realize that there's potential to hit you know me for a small increase me in the property taxes the personal property taxes and then, then we could do a bigger me decrease like maybe even a dollar which would be essentially on a million dollar assessment that'd be a thousand dollars me so so it's just something to take in mind because it gives us some policy me can uh, control or, or ability to kind of say this is what we want to do policy wise and to kind of support that mean um, financially so so I understand why we do the split and it certainly makes sense but if we want to give ourselves some policy flexibility we uh, we might want to consider that in the future and and of course that would require a dialogue with the residents mean to let them know what it is that we're thinking of doing and why it is that we want to do that because this is a community that does support we, the businesses, the small businesses. So, 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 just something to put out there for us to think about um, in the future as we try to do more progressive things when it comes to the roadways and maybe other um, things that may impact me and um, businesses. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, think further. Okay. So, just to clarify again, we have a motion by Mr. Hurd. Um, for residential factor of one, which results in a tax rate of 1077, that motion was seconded by Mr. Helmuth. There's no action being taken on a residential exemption or a small business exemption. So uh, with that vote, I will now ask the board, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So we're done. There's thank you very much for your presentation and to all the board members. And again, thank you for this every fifth year where you, you have a revaluation year. I know it is a lot of extra work with the Department of Revenue. So thank you and your team for all your efforts. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And the rest of the board, thank you very much. Thanks. Say thank you to your staff for us. Yeah. I we'll sh be. should have written their names down. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Uh, next is our consent agenda. Three items this evening. Item six is the minutes of meeting October 21, 2024. Item seven is a request for free parking for local holiday shopping. Um, and item eight is a request for a special one day beer and wine license on November 23rd, 2024 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event. Move approval. Second. Yeah, second. Yeah. Okay, any further comment? I, 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 um, I'm still skeptical made about the, the, um, the, the value of the free parking, meaning whether you know, it's not counterproductive to what we really want to achieve. I mean, part of the reason for paying for parking is to be in, increase circulation. You know? So that's my only concern about it. And I don't know if there's really a strong case made for, for it, but we know we're doing it, you know, man, I'm gonna go along with it, you know, but just to kind of flag that, just kind of concerned about it. That's it, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And I think before we vote on that, I and mean, we, I think we have asked in prior years if there have been any issues on these holiday weekends with just complaints about parking. And if there are, it's certainly something worth right. uh, yeah. revisiting. Uh, Ms. Dan, what did you? I had a, I had a question um, and I apologize to the time manager that I'm just bringing this on you, so it's perfectly fine to say that you'll need to get back with me on this, but what are we, what are we uh, foregoing in revenue for each of those days, even a ballpark figure? And again, if you just need time to do that, I did not ask you this in advance. Uh, this is a good model for town meeting members, by the way, to, <laughs> if you're going to spring something up with somebody, don't assume <laughs> that you have an answer. Uh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Hamath. I do not have a specific revenue figure for you, but I think it would be easy enough to estimate based on, you know, a Saturday collection in November, perhaps, if we're able to get to that level of uh, granularity with our data, but happy to come up with some sort of estimate of what a, a weekend daily value may be. Sure. Yeah, that's fine at some point, just just um, out of curiosity. Great. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Hurd. Of all the items to discuss, I didn't think we'd be talking about this one, but <laughs> I would just say, I mean, Saturday is a low lower volume day i think during the week where people are you know businesses in town or whatnot it seems a little busier and all the businesses ask for this on you know the communities i serve on so i think the businesses appreciate that the town does this 
I mean, the, the meters were never really put in there to create revenue for the town. It go, that goes right back into the business districts. So, you know, they're losing that. You know, it's, it's more the businesses that are losing the park and benefits money that goes back into their own business district. But it, it is something that's very popular with the local businesses, the small business, given the free parking on these days. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Okay. Uh, oh, that time, just uh, to Mr. Say, King. To, to be clear, I think the memo elucidates this well, but this is just for the parking lots, yeah. not necessarily for what we know as the street meters directly in front of businesses. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Feeney. Okay, so on the consent agenda, items six through eight, and, and again, maybe we should just include this idea of consent agenda sticking a little longer than we thought. Where, where we have now voted more recently that there is no impact if we grant the license at the town hall, part of the 500 feet, I, I think we can include that in any vote that we take that, that there is no impact on any educational or spiritual activities, just incorporate that into our votes uh, as well. So on a motion uh, for approval of the consent agenda by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, next are appointments. Council on Aging, Darcy Carr, uh, for a term to expire 6-30-2027. Ms. Carr is joining us, I believe, by, through Zoom. Okay. That's Great. Good evening, Ms. Carr. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Sure. Sure. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you for your interest in serving on the Council on Aging. If you could just tell us a little about yourself and, and, and why you're interested in serving. Sure. Uh, happy to do so. So I'm Darcy Carr. I'm a 20-year resident of Arlington. I live down uh, in the eastern part of Arlington. Uh, two children, uh, one who just graduated Arlington High, one who was a junior there. Um, my day-to-day -day work involves working with uh, frail elders. I run government programs for Medicare and Medicaid um, in, my, in my day job. Um, I'm really passionate about reducing social isolation and loneliness in the elderly population, and so um, I'd be honored to uh, be able to give back by serving on the board. Thank, thank, thank you very much, and thank you for your interest. I'll now turn to board members. And Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> um, I first would like to move approval of Ms. Carr uh, for the Council on Aging uh, appointment. Um, and I want to thank you in advance for um, all the work that we couldn't afford, <laughs> but that, that you're volunteering um, to, to give uh, to us. And one of the things, and um, I believe Mr. DeCourcy, you are representative yes. on the Council on Aging, um, that this current board has really put forth, um, along with the Council on Aging, is also Commission on Disability, of, of really keeping that in the forefront of, of decisions that we make, as well as moving forward, um, trying to better understand the population and, and how we can serve it. And I, I think we're on the up, up, uptake for that, um, but there's a lot more that we um, can be doing and we just need to find out what that is and having someone of your expertise and, and your experience in education um, it certainly will benefit towards that. And this board, um, collectively or through our liaison, Mr. DeCourcy, certainly looks forward to um, working with you individually as well as on the committee for um, uh, the past three years now, there have been at least one to two good initiatives coming out of um, the Council on Aging and not just infrastructure and, and, and getting the community center um, rebuilt and renovated, but also programs for it. So um, I, I look forward to what you feel you can bring uh, to that and, uh, and sincerely thank you for volunteering your time and your family. Thank you, uh, your family on behalf of all of us because it is a family commitment. So thank you. Mr. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Second that. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Okay, any other comments? Okay. Um, yeah, and, th and thank you, Ms. Carford. It, it's a very impressive resume and we really appreciate all the volunteer work that you're already doing in town. And, and uh, just very briefly, one of the, the great things about Division Three college athletics is that you can play on two different sports. I was really impressed that you're on the varsity hockey team <laughs> and the varsity softball team. So uh, that's, that's quite a feat, Mr. Hurd. Well, I, I, I will echo that and one of the, my 
stories playing hockey at Tufts that I tell the kids is when we went, to, we played at Amherst in the Amherst rink, and we were the Jumbos, and someone threw a bucket of mice on the ice <laughs> at Amherst College, and the mice were scared. We had a, a little bit of a delay while we gathered up the mice that were running around, but. My kids always like that story. They tell their friends. Thank you, sir. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the timing, actually, of the appointment is good because the next meeting of the Council on Aging is this Thursday, uh, their monthly November meeting. So um, on a motion for approval of, by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, all in favor say aye. 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 Great. Congratulations, and thank you again. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to serve. Okay, next is open forum. Uh, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or a request. Uh, is there anybody here this evening who wishes to be heard in open forum? See anybody? Is anybody on Zoom? Seeing no hands raised. Okay, uh, we will move on. Um, item 10, future select board meetings. And, and Ms. Mar, if you could remind us what we're, are we just scheduled through December at this point? That's correct. Okay. And I figured where we have Absolutely. a few <laughs> lengthy agendas coming up if we could set the Sure, meetings yeah, we could go for a few months. So if we can take a look at January, um, we'll start there. Okay, so, um, so we're looking at the 6th, 13th, 20th, and 27th for, and the 20th is Martin Luther King Day, so it, it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if the, yeah, how people feel about the 13th and the 27th. I, okay. Can someone remind me, when does the warrant close in January? Is it 28th? What is the 31st. it? 31st. The 31st. 31st. Last well, Friday. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So it's 13th and 27th? Yeah. Um, yeah, because a week before now, I, I am looking in February, um, and we can, depending on where the board is, the, the February vacation week is the 17th. I'm actually out the 10th, I know that for sure, but I'm not sure it makes sense to have a meeting two weeks in a row for, yeah. between the 27th yeah. and the 3rd. Um, so we could go forward on the 10th, and, and we'll just have. Are, are you out the whole week? Just that. Just that Monday, I'm, I'm, I'm away would, through that Monday. Would you want to want to do the 12th or oh. do it the Wednesday? Is that bad? Uh, TAC meetings. I mean, I, I mean, I this has precedence over TAC. But if there's one meeting, I do like to try to attend. It's the TAC meetings, but um, uh, but if that's the only option, uh, it's fine. Well, how many meetings do you say in February? Because we have to start having a warrant article review hearing. So mm -hmm. sometimes we end up going. Just about weekly, weekly. So we should set at least two dates in. Two, yeah. I, I, but no, probably thinking something the week of the tenth and something the third, week of the twenty-fourth. Depending on how many yeah. articles come in. Um, and maybe two at the end of the month because it, it will start for the twenty-fourth, maybe in the twenty-sixth, as, as, as well. And if it's if it's not necessary, so I'll I'll leave it to it, it's if if you have it the tenth, you have four members. If you have it the twelfth, I don't know if if everybody. Um, <coughs> If you can make it, notwithstanding the uh, the conflict, Mr. Diggins, or, or or what, but I'll leave it to the to the board on 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 that one. I just want to alert people. It does make sense that week um, to have the meeting as opposed to the prior week yeah, because of twenty seventh. I agree. I'd say twelve and twenty four, and where you'll be setting the warrant article hearings, you definitely should be here. Yeah. Barring yeah. something that comes up that you can't be. But. Okay. So is that okay? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. If, and and then if we need Maybe to, we schedule the 26th too, just in case, or just to see where we are. Or would you rather just wait and do it every week in in, in March if necessary? You mean the 24th and the like two? Yeah, days depending later. on. We'll we'll be starting hearings then. Now we might not know how many we have. If you'd rather, we could push it into March and just schedule the third, and and um, that may be every week depending on on activity. Want to do that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So why don't, why don't we set aside every Monday with with the in, once we get the warrant articles, then we'll know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know where yeah. we are. Definitely. 
do that because so every year we don't do that and we end up needing them, you know. And so we might as well like set it aside. And if we finish early, we finish early, you know. Um, um, and, and then, and then yeah, we'll, and we'll, we'll see how many articles there are too. We yeah. could adjust, but for now, um, we'll set that aside. Okay, so do January 13th, January 27th, February 12th. As long as we keep the agendas lean during February the Warren 24th. article. Anything non-essential can get pushed till after the Warren articles. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, PowerPoint 47 minute presentations. We're talking to you. Go ahead. Okay. I'm only looking to my left. I can't look anywhere else. Go ahead. But we normally have meetings every two weeks. So, so we might have to do some business every other week, Mr. Hurt. Yeah, okay. we'll do. Yeah. And it but, may but not be it, necessary. It's we always just don't been know a tradition yet. during Warren article seasons, you know, some of the presentations we get from town departments and whatnot that can wait, they can wait. So <laughs> let's okay. make sure we're cognizant of people's time. <laughs> okay. So can someone review the dates again? Yes, January 13th, January 27th, February 12th, February 24th, and for now, we'll March post it every, every Monday in March. Yeah. Through the 31st? Yeah. Okay. And again, I, yeah, I don't yeah, anticipate it's, it's going to be every week, but but just so we. Mm -hmm. Oh, I. I but we'll find out. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we tend to need them. We tend. <laughs> so so. Okay, um, and now on to new business, uh, Ms. Mar. No new business, thank you. Attorney Cunningham. No new business, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Feeney. No new business. Mr. Diggins. I always forget, and I have no business. No, no new business. No. Okay, uh, Mrs. Mahan. I'm trying to think if I should say. Um, no new business. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Helmuth? No new business. Mr. Hurd? No new business. Oh, boy, I'm going to break that straight. Mr. DeCourcy, do you have any new business? <laughs> Mr. DeCourcy has. Mr. Chairman, just, I mean. Just, um, well, yeah, no, I'll, I'll try to be brief. So this Thursday, in, in this board, as you know, we've had a number of MUGAR updates over the years, and, and um, the, the board has been steadfast in its opposition. To the, to, to the proposed development um, at, at Thorndike Place on, on Dorothy Road. Um, the Conservation Commission is nearing the end of their hearings. I had thought that the last hearing before the record closes would be this Thursday. I learned today that there is another extension until December 5th, but um, as a town between our delegation, between town meeting, uh, there has been unified opposition to this. That would be, if people haven't attended Conservation Commission meetings, that would be the one to, to attend. It's the final one. I will say that there continue to be differences of opinion between the applicants, experts on groundwater and, and, and flood water and, and um, seasonal high groundwater levels and experts that the Arlington Land Trust have hired. That's what actually prompted this last continuance. There was a number of questions and inconsistencies that were um, brought forward by the Arlington Land Trust experts that the applicants experts evidently need a lot of further time to respond to. And I do find it interesting that we're nine years into this and what we were told years ago is no problem that this area can handle the flooding by the proponent. Here we are at the end of the Conservation Commission hearing process and they still haven't provided the answers and and so that is something um, I encourage people to attend that meeting if they will this is Conservation Commission similar to the ZBA since the pandemic they still have remote meetings um, if the, again that's their choice every committee can just decide whether they want to be in person or remote if I think going forward if there is an opportunity for us or whether it's to the town manager's office to help facilitate with some commissions if to help them with what they may need to conduct a hybrid meeting you know whether it be through zoom there's only a few places that 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 can be done but i mean i, I think again going forward i'm not saying it's the next meeting but it did it's been a lot of questions like when are we going to get a chance to come in person to their meeting and it's up to the chair of each committee but i think it's also helpful for, for us as a town to, to maybe facilitate um, different hearing rooms beyond what's available right now as, as we go forward. So I wanted to, to, to point that out. And I also, 
Um, Mrs. Mahan mentioned it at the beginning. Um, we had a long range planning committee meeting last Friday. Mrs. Mahan and I attended. Uh, Mr. Feeney and Mr. McGee did an excellent job laying out the current state of the, the five year plan and uh, we will probably meet again in February after we have a better idea of the governor's budget. But uh, I, thought it, I thought it went really well. Uh, there was a number of questions and, and um, they, they were all answered and um, we'll be back in a few months. So with that, I will um, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Sure. Okay, motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.